see you tonight. Praising the Lord for the opportunity again to be together. I'm starting the service tonight because I want to let those on the live stream know that we are having technical difficulties. So if it is fading in and out on you, we apologize. We believe the problem is on our end and the technicians are working hard uh, to fix that. And so bear with us. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, let's lift our voices to sing to the Lord together. We're going to sing a song tonight that I don't know that I've ever sung with you here. I know the teens have sung it. Um, you may have sung it before, but we're going to stand and sing, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the council out of Psalm 1. So if you know it, sing along. We'll sing that first stanza twice just so we make sure we know where we're going, and then we'll do the second stanza after that. Let's pray. Father, we humble ourselves before you tonight, Lord, and first off, we want to thank you for the countless blessings that you shower on us each day uh, of our lives, Lord, and we're so thankful, Lord, to just be born in this country with all the medical advances that we've seen recently, people in the hospital, and thank you for those that are coming out, thank you for those that got good reports, and Thank you for walking with us as we have gone through uh, our own time. Lord, and we pray that this evening you will bless uh, our time together. Lord, uh, help us to hear from you. Lord, if we meet here without you, we've met in vain. And so, Lord, uh, please uh, be with us tonight. Thank you for this church, our staff, Lord, uh, as they labor uh, here to accomplish your will. We pray for our military people. Uh, some that are deployed, even those that are stateside, are all uh, in a serious uh, occupation that has many hazards. And so, Lord, I pray you'll be with each of them. Be with our college students, Lord, uh, our young people. Lord, they're our next generation. I pray that you'll open their hearts and minds to get a grasp on uh, what we're doing here, what we're all about, and that they'll make it a part of their lives and continue on uh, in the things of the Lord. Father, be with us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue tonight, let me just share a few announcements. Uh, this Saturday, we'll be conducting our monthly food distribution ministry at 10 o'clock a.m. 
Uh, it'll be curbside pickup only again this month due to uh, the virus situation. But uh, if you know someone who uh, could benefit from this ministry, uh, please let them know. Please invite them. Again, 10 o'clock this Saturday, uh, they'll receive a couple bags of grocery items, uh, plus uh, maybe a few loaves of bread uh, and uh, information about our church, uh, some gospel literature as well. So please be inviting and uh, praying about this ministry. We still have uh, giving statements from 2020 available at the welcome desk. Please pick up yours if you have not done so already. And uh, contact Denise Darden if you'd like her to email yours to you. Also have deacon care lists available uh, on the back table as well. And then uh, I just added, I added this one for myself. Uh, men, don't forget that Sunday is Valentine's Day. It's never too late to pick up a gift. Right, ladies? Last minute's okay. As long as you put a little bit of thought into it. But uh, I'm just teasing. But again, uh, reminder, reminder, uh, men, Sunday's Valentine's Day. Tonight is week five of our Good News Bible Institute. Uh, remember that uh, Matt Brown's class on missions is in the fellowship hall all the way down uh, near the kitchen. Uh, my class on a, a biblical approach to post-traumatic stress is uh, in the next bay in the fellowship hall uh, where Pastor Asher's Sunday school class meets. And then Tavis Long's class on apologetics will continue here uh, in the auditorium and it'll be live streamed. Remember also that you can listen to recordings of any of those, uh, any of these, uh, the classes, the past uh, few lessons. If you go to our church website uh, and then click under media and then sermons, there's a special tab you can hit and you can access uh, any of those recordings from the three classes. And then finally tonight, I'm told we have lots of extra bread right outside the food pantry. So as you're leaving tonight, uh, please help yourself to that if, uh, if you could use some. Again, we welcome you. Thank you for being here this evening. Hopefully, uh, live stream is uh, working, and we welcome those who are joining us uh, that way as well. All right, I'm getting a thumbs up from higher ground, so praise the Lord. Um, pray for Pastor Radice when he reminds men about Valentine's Day and follows up and says, I'm just kidding. Uh, that shouldn't get to Cindy wherever she's at, all right? That's, that'll be our secret tonight. Just told the world, but it'll still be our secret. All right. Do want to thank the Lord as you look at your prayer list on the back for several praises tonight. Uh, when, the, when the prayer sheet says a great offering on Sunday, that's an understatement. We, we had a wonderful offering. Um, and then Lenora is thanking the Lord. Her ankle is completely healed. George Lindsay is doing well, does not need physical therapy. We thank the Lord for that. And then uh, some victories as well with legislation that, is, that was bad all around. And we keep you updated uh, through email. Uh, Brother Sam Warren does a great job keeping us updated. But, uh, but uh, that, that died, and that's good. And so we wanted to include that. Also, uh, Linda Lennon, praise the Lord, did not have a stroke. She is in obesity for treatment on some sinus issues, and they're looking at some other things. But, but um, we thank the Lord for uh, his protection there. And then number 12, Clay Hocutt did get his biopsy result back, and it is not cancer. And so it's benign. He still is going to have to have surgery to remove that tumor. But uh, that was wonderful, wonderful news today. And so we thank the Lord. Let me add this praise also. Yesterday, uh, I spent the day on a uh, Zoom uh, meeting. The entire day was a board meeting with the Foundations Baptist Fellowship International. And uh, the main topic, Monday night and all through yesterday, was just the challenges that our churches are facing with COVID, 
uh, with the political situation the way it is. Uh, and uh, of course, we're, we're concerned not only for what we're hearing in the news, but what's behind what we're hearing in the news, right? Uh, however, uh, what uh, I came away from the meeting just rejoicing uh, that here in Virginia, we have the freedom to meet like we are tonight. And, uh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Praise the Lord for uh, the live stream capabilities as well. Uh, but we have brethren across this country, they still haven't been able to meet in person for services, and it's been a year. And, uh, and so um, some who are able to meet, um, they can't remove the mask for any reason according to the dictates of their particular state. Uh, and so uh, we, we have a lot to be thankful for, and it was just a good reminder to us, uh, as many of us have had COVID, as we know folks who are in heaven because uh, the Lord used that to promote them, uh, but how we need to uh, consider one another, right? And to be careful, uh, especially taking into account the needs of others, those uh, who especially are weaker in their own health. Uh, we know, even with COVID, that it doesn't make sense uh, who it attacks, how it attacks, uh, who's going to get the hardest with it. If you try to find scientific answers to all that, it's, your head's going to hurt. Uh, at the same time, it's a real problem, a uh, real danger. And we, so we just need to pray for one another, consider one another. But let's not forget to give thanks to God for his protection and for the blessings. And I appreciated what Brother Sayer said. Uh, we have so much to thank the Lord for, and uh, we need to continue to do so. As you look at the back of your prayer sheet, just a couple other things to remind you about. Here are updates. Number eight, Vicki Canfield's mother. Still in the hospital, uh, may have pneumonia, uh, more, more testing being done there. Uh, Dwight Dunn had skin cancer surgery on Tuesday. Uh, they are going to go back in on Friday uh, just to make sure that they got it all. And so right now, essentially, he's dealing with that open wound until they can go back and, and just double check. But pray that there won't be any, any more, that they'll be able to close that up. Uh, if you look down at number 15, Elmer Justice, uh, this is Roy's brother. Again, recent fall resulting in broken ribs. Uh, they're concerned he may have had a stroke also. 16, let's pray for Roy, having dizzy spells, also has a skin cancer spot, and that will be removed on Monday. Uh, well, that was removed on, on Monday. If you go down to number 21, and if you would please uh, pray, this is Richard Phoebus' father-in-law. Pastor Richard Smith is the pastor at Calvary Baptist in Norfolk, and uh, just over three weeks ago, he uh, lost his oldest brother to COVID. At the beginning of this week, he lost another brother to COVID. So in about a month span, um, both these men knew the Lord, loved the Lord, but very difficult. And so please pray for uh, Pastor Smith and his family. Number 22, Susie Shoemaker uh, suffered a seizure yesterday, He's taken to the hospital. Just pray that the Lord will settle her heart. Um, the, an MRI indicated that the tumor is growing back even though she continues to have chemo treatments. Brother Chuck, any more that you want to share? Is that accurate? Okay, all right. And so let's pray for Susie. Pray, pray for Chuck's dad as well. Um, the, the burden on him during this time as he cares uh, for his wife. If you'd add these requests to your prayer sheet, and then we'll divide up. And uh, again, our classes will take time to pray before the teaching time tonight. First of all, pray for a gentleman named Gordon. Uh, he is part of the Sea Hope team. He's the diesel mechanic. He had a heart attack last night. Uh, is in ICU in Miami, uh, and uh, and they're probably going to need, be needing to do open heart surgery. So pray for him. It's good to see Nikki Brown here tonight. She's having some treatments this week uh, to deal with 
uh, really extreme fatigue. They're not sure why. Uh, I say, well, she's holding a new baby. That might have something to do with it. But this has been something that's been ongoing. And uh, so trying some treatment this week to help her. And, and would you just pray? Uh, there's been success uh, with others who have had this particular treatment. And we're, we're praying that way for Nikki. Gary Akery is recovering from shoulder surgery last week, so pray for him. And then if you'd also pray for our son Ryan. His deployment is up, and he flies into Camp Lejeune on Monday. And so pray, just pray for a safe flight. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to be able to spend some time with him next week. Uh, we're excited about that. All right, just a reminder that uh, when you come in on Wednesday nights, if you would please, uh, if you have a request to share, fill one of these prayer slips out. And uh, I was reminded that I need to share one other request with you. All right. Uh, Gloria Kissinger. Many of you know the Kissingers. If you have uh, any history with good news, Dr. Kissinger, former AFBM director, uh, his wife Gloria, age 90, is very ill with COVID. And this will help you remember to pray for her. Uh, she is Mrs. Cole's best girlfriend. All right? So pray for Gloria Kissinger. Very, very important request there. All right, let's stand. And you have been reminded about locations. We'll let you head that way. Feel a little uh, off-centered here, uh, but uh, definitely we'll speak to this side over here. All right. Well,
We're going to get started here. We're going to have a word of prayer. Before we begin, we'll remember some of these prayer requests that were mentioned. And uh, I do trust that uh, it's been a good week for you. This is a, uh, the topic we're going to talk about is probably one of really depressing topics. And uh, I, if I do my job well, tonight you'll leave quite devastated. Uh, and then uh, hopefully next week we'll pick it up. Uh, but uh, we'll look at it. We're going to look at the problem of evil. And uh, if, you, if you haven't noticed, there's a problem. Uh, last night I was like, I'm going to see how I can really set the theme for the class. So I'm going to go find a compilation of all the problems that we've had in 2020. <laughs> I couldn't find one that, uh, that was short enough uh, to show in just a couple minutes. Uh, but uh, everything from Australian bushfires... COVID was quite popular here in 2020, uh, to uh, just uh, uh, just a variety. I mean, the impeachment a year ago, that's what we were uh, maybe staying tuned for, the impeachment. Hey, we get to do it again. Uh, so uh, uh, so it, it's just quite the year. Uh, the problem of evil uh, is definitely something that we have seen, and, and uh, so we'll look at that this evening. But before we do that... Uh, let's mention these prayer requests, but I also, uh, when, when discussing the problem of evil, it, it's very important that we do not leave here devastated. Uh, and, uh, you know, you come to church to be edified, correct? And, uh, and so if you leave here depressed, uh, that, that's, a, that's a tough one. So we'll look at it, but I really do ask uh, that the Lord would uh, give me wisdom as we look at this topic, and, and I trust that, uh, that we'll, we'll be faithful to the Word of God as we look at this, the problem of evil. Uh, but before we do that, uh, before we get into that, let's have a word of prayer. I'm going to ask the Lord to, uh, to help me, and, and I pray that you will as well. And uh, So let's just go to the Lord at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have given to us. Father, it's easy for us to look around us and become a little bit despondent. Uh, it's easy to look around and and even as the psalmist said in Psalm 73, I, uh, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And I, I looked and I saw their blessings and I saw what was happening to them and, and I didn't understand why. But then I went into the house of the Lord and then I understood their end. Lord, I pray that those that are listening here, as they came to the house of the Lord tonight, Father, I pray that we would see what is going to happen in the end. In fact, Father, you have given us your word, and you have told us what's going to happen, and you will be victorious. And so, Father, I pray that we would approach tonight with a, a per perspective of victory. And Father, I pray that we would not get so caught up in the circumstances around us that we forget who is the sovereign. Lord, as we contemplate and as we look at this, what we as humans call the problem of evil, which is no problem to you at all, Father, there's needs that evil has brought into our world, needs that we now have because of evil. Father, there's many amongst us who are sick, who are ill. Father, some with COVID that uh, they're battling it, they're fighting some for their lives. Others, Father, we don't want to forget those that are ill because of cancer or things that have been uh, put into their lives, that have come into their lives, Lord, and, and, uh, and we hear about them often, but Father, they're still hurting, they're suffering. And Father, I pray as a church, we would lift them up, we would encourage them, we would pray for them, Father, it's hard to think of it often this way. But Father, would you even take the illness and the pain and glorify yourself with it? Father, I don't know what that means for many, but I pray that you would use our weaknesses to show yourself strong. 
Father, I pray for those who would like to be here tonight but can't. Maybe they're traveling or maybe they're, they're working or maybe they're doing other things that, are, that has kept them away. Lord, as those that are watching on live stream, I pray that you would keep them encouraged. We thank you that they can join us each week. Lord, I pray that you would continue to strengthen them and heal them. And Lord, we look forward to the time when we can be back together. Lord, we do pray for Ryan Asher as he uh, prepares to come home. Lord, just I uh, pray that his time there in Okinawa would, uh, as a, not a new Marine any longer, he's been in for a little bit. Lord, I pray, though, that uh, you continue to bless him. And Lord, would you use him to be a witness and an example to those Marines in his, in his battalion? Father, we think of others who are deployed right now. I think of Brandon Oswald, Lord, who is who's out to sea, I pray that you would bless the Oswalds, be with uh, Megan and the girls. Lord, I pray that you keep them encouraged. But Lord, I pray that you would watch over Brandon and, and just be with him and keep him safe as he flies and, and as he, he does the nation's bidding. Lord, I pray that you would, you would watch over him and that, that, uh, that in, the entire carrier strike group that he's with. Father, I pray for those that are here sitting here tonight who may be thinking or contemplating of something that's in their life that they... Uh, they just are struggling with. Maybe it is physical. Maybe it's spiritual. Maybe it's just they're emotionally drained. It's the middle of the week. Father, they've worked hard all week. Lord, I pray that you would be a blessing to them. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. And so, Father, as we dive into this topic that, again, for us is a, a bit of a conundrum for you who knows all things, there is no mystery. And so, Father, I pray that we would stay faithful and stay truthful, Lord, and to your word. And, and, Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified in what is said and done. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your book, or my knee just went out. I'm just kidding. That was, uh, I dropped this. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 45. I should learn every week the clip comes off, and I never learn. So... That's right, to the sound people. Every week I break it. Psalm, or Isaiah, did I say Psalm? Isaiah 45 is what I meant if I said that. I, that's what I meant. Isaiah 45. This is a verse perhaps you've read before. And honestly, it is a, still a bit of a mystery, even as I've studied it and looked at it. But we're going to use it tonight, and I think it's an important verse to start with. Isaiah 45, looking at verse 5, Isaiah 45, we're going to begin in verse 5, and in this chapter, this is what the prophet Isaiah says in verse 5, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace. Here it is. And create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You may or may not know that that was in the Bible, that God said, I create evil. And if we want, we could really look into Hebrew and say, well, what does the word create mean? The word create really does mean what it says in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we got to be very careful that when we get into wording, that we don't try to explain the, inter the interpretation away so that we say, well, this must not mean he really created evil, because then we could just go to Genesis 1 and say, well, he really then didn't create the heavens and the earth. So we need to take creation as it is, the word creation. And I think it's important also, when you see words like create in the Bible, to also differentiate those words from words like made. Or formed. Because I think the nuance is that when God created something, He created it out of nothing. 
But when he made something or formed it, now made is often used interchangeably because he does say he made the greater light and the lesser light, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the firmament. You'll see that, that word made in Genesis chapter 1. But when it comes to man, you'll see he formed man. And do you remember what he did to form man? He did not create man out of nothing. He created it out of something. What was it? Dirt. That's right. Dust. It's interesting, if you didn't know, the word Adam is the same we get for Edom in, uh, later, which means red. So if you want to know the color of the skin of Adam, I think he was red. Red clay. I don't know how red he was, but this is my opinion, based on his name. Adam. Red. But we see that that word formed is different. But when it says create, he created it. So we don't want to explain things away because we got to be careful that when we explain something away in one passage, we're not explaining something away in the other passage. So then maybe perhaps we look at that word evil. And I think over the next couple of weeks, we are going to define that word a little more clearly because it's very important to understand that we're using a word evil, uh, and we need to be on the same page as what we're talking about when we're talking about evil. But I also want to not get too, too deep into it and say, well, this is the nuances of that word, because the Bible, it is very important to understand that the Bible communicates to us in language we understand. For example, if you talk to many, many Calvinists, not every Calvinist would have this view, but many Calvinists would, where they would say that uh, they have no problem that God predestined people to go to hell uh, because that is a demonstration of his love for them. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. Because what they'll do is they'll say he loves them enough to judge them. Well, that type of, that, that definition of love in a very technical definition is not the way we use love. And God is not using in the scriptures, in the, in the, they don't, there's not technical definitions. We like to use technical definitions at times. And what do I mean by technical definition? I mean a word that means something in a precisely only way you mean it. For example, when I was taking uh, classes, uh, we would uh, write papers and they would say that in philosophy, when you write a paper, start by defining the term and say, this is how I'm going to use this term throughout the entire paper. And anybody can agree or disagree with you, however, that's fine. But if you're going to use that term, tell them how you're using that term. And you can make that term, and this is what a lot of philosophers do, to mean whatever they want it to mean. <laughs> I think we find in our society, words can just mean whatever we want it to mean anymore. But I do, when I, think, when I read the Bible, the Bible doesn't just have meaning, it says something. And a lot of times we like, what, like to think of, well, what does it mean? Well, what does it say? That's what it means, it's what it says. So when it says, created evil, very simply tonight, we're going to take that and say, wow, God created evil? And is that not a contradiction of who he is? I think we're going to try to unpack that, and you're going to leave here unsatisfied. I'm just up front and going to be honest with you, because I'm challenged by it. But I don't want you to leave here devastated or your faith shaken, because it's okay to not know the ways of God. It's okay. What do I mean by that? In the same book of Isaiah, God says, hey, your ways are not my ways. Neither are your thoughts my thoughts. As the heaven is high above the earth, so are my ways better than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So it's okay to leave here and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, I just don't know, but I'm going to trust you. And that's where we'll get to the end. And so I've given you where I want to go, I hope we can get there. 
So we're going to look at the problem of evil. The problem of evil. We've looked at this verse here. And, uh, and we're going to really concentrate on that. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. And we will get to the point where we'll define evil. And I'll just kind of give you a teaser right now. Evil is not a positive thing. You say, well, brilliant. <laughs> Never thought it was. But it's actually negative. And not just negative in the way we view it. Not, it's not just negative in that we just have a poor view of it. It's negative in that I'm going to try to make the argument that evil is not tangible. It's not a thing. It's the absence of something. And what do you think the absence is? It's the absence of what? What's that? Good. And what do we know about God? God is good. So let's take it from there. What is evil? The absence of? Well, there's a, we do have a problem. Do, don't we define God as omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent? So to say the absence of God may, and I'm just going to leave it there for now, may be incoherent. It may be contradictory. How can God, who is omnipresent, be absent? I think we can get there. And I'm not going to argue that he's not omnipresent. I'm going to argue exactly that he is omnipresent, and we still have evil. But it was this problem where many would say, the problem with evil is actually, it, it proves, if you will, that God does not exist. So for the first couple of weeks, we talked about how we think. And we move from that idea of secularism and how our society is thinking today into a more, uh, uh, more for, into the arguments of the existence of God. And as we looked at the existence of God, I don't know if we, you know, we, we could have spent the entire 10 weeks just on that. But we left it, and I hope you're okay and satisfied, that we left it with God exists, okay? So hopefully you were not disappointed that we, we just said, you know what, we're going to leave it at God exists. But there were those, mainly in the 1960s, philosophers who would say, ha ha, ha ha, but wait, 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 if you insist God exists, you have a logical contradiction in that. And they went into the attributes of God that many would say, these are what define, or these are the attributes of God. We just mentioned some. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. God is good. And, and they, they took all those and they said, now, if God is good and God is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful, evil cannot, or God cannot exist because evil exists. And then their argument was really something like this. They, they, they put in there, they implied that if God is good, and bad things happen, then God cannot necessarily exist because if he's good, he would stop those bad things from happen, happening. And if he doesn't stop them, he must not be stopping them, one, because he may not be powerful enough to stop them. And so they're assuming that not only is God uh, not good, but they would say God's not powerful enough because God can do anything. God can do anything. Be careful with that statement. God cannot do anything or everything. What are some things God can't do? He can't sin. He can't lie. There's things that God cannot do. The Bible even says, for there is God who cannot lie. There's something. 
So, so be careful of that. But that, that's what they would say, that, that, that there's a logical contradiction because God exists. You say, Christians, you say God exists, and yet there is the existence of evil. Then that means, logically, God cannot exist. And that was called the deductive argument for the problem of evil. The deductive argument for the problem of evil. The deductive problem for the, the, deductive, uh, problem, for the problem of evil the argument, we talked inductively a couple weeks ago, and I mentioned that term, or actually I think Addison talked about it, and he brought up the idea of inductive arguments. We haven't really talked about deductive arguments, but deductive arguments to me uh, are beautiful arguments. I mean, if you ever, gentlemen, can form a deductive argument with your wife, you've won. Because deductive arguments cannot be contradicted, but they're hard, and I never come up with them with my wife. <laughs> Not that I, she can't contradict me. Sometimes I just contradict myself. <laughs> no problem doing that. But a, a deductive argument is one that cannot be contradicted. And so the, many of these secular philosophers said, hey, look, we got you, Christians. You can't logically argue for the existence of God, and still ha we have the existence of evil. And for about 20 years in the 60s to the 80s, that argument held in a lot of philosophy. And, and I'll go back to say, this is where I think we have a, a we had kind of a dark ages in even in, our, in our, uh, our, our churches in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, not just in our culture, but in our, in our, in our society and in our churches. It, it fed into our churches. Um, music wasn't very good. It's, I mean, it just it was, I mean, even, uh, I mean, just, I'm, I'm talking even the, the, of course, you had the rise of contemporary Christian music, and, 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 but just music in general, um, you know, there were, there were some, I'm not going to just cast the right across the board and say all writers were bad, it wasn't, it wasn't that time, uh, but there, it just wasn't a great time, music, uh, preaching, we had a lot of preaching about standards for that time, uh, and, and standards are good, uh, but we really started getting away from doctrine and preaching about theology and doctrine. And so while Christians were trying to figure this out, there did come a philosopher onto the scene out of Yale, and uh, he was a Christian. He's still alive. He teaches at Notre Dame, in fact, uh, and he's not Catholic. He's, he's, he's very much Protestant. He's a Reformed guy, and his name is Alvin Plantinga. And Alvin Plantinga comes onto the scene, and he's, he tackles this problem. And he says, I'm going to prove that the deductive argument for the problem of evil is, uh, it, it, we do have a coherent, we, we, it doesn't disprove that God exists. And he went to work on it. And long story short, he really did. He comes and he starts making these arguments. And, uh, and what he did was, he just went into the logical uh, argument of the existence of God, and he started forming premises. And if you know anything about logic and, and, and how our logical arguments work, you have to have a premise. Uh, you have a major premise. You have a minor premise. And then you have the conclusion, and it, state, it makes a statement. And so he went and they started working it, and, uh, and he, he did it. He, decided, he proved that you cannot logically disprove God. Because all he had to do was get to the point where he said, but God might exist somewhere. You just don't know. And the philosophers, they, they kind of put that to rest, that the deductive argument for the problem of evil really wasn't a strong argument to make. You can't just categorize it, categorically say God doesn't exist based upon just the existence of evil, because you don't know. So, I said to make a long story short, I really made that short story very long. Now we're going to look at inductive arguments, because these are a little more real. Now, inductive, though, is when you start looking around you and you see things because we can look around our world and we can say, there's evil in this world. And if, as a Christian, it's never, if it has never bothered you, of what, I mean, we, we, we talk about it all the time. We look around us, and, and, and a conversation may go something like this. Oh, the world is really bad. Lord, we are ready for you to come back. 
Lord, you're coming back, aren't you? I mean, it's bad. Lord, today would be a great day. Lord, tomorrow would be fine too. But Lord, are you coming? And pretty soon we get to the point, if you ever never thought, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That help my unbelief is because the problem of evil is affecting you. And I don't, I don't want to say you're weak and you're weak in your faith. I'm not. I'm just saying it affects us as believers. We read the Bible and it says in the last days, perilous times will come. Things are going to get worse and worse and worse. And if you haven't ever asked yourself, God, how much worse is it going to get? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So, if you could ask God, though, one question, what would it be? In a poll of American adults, most people were asked this question, what would you ask God if you could ask one thing? And the question was that they would ask God, why is there pain and suffering in the world. Now, I think, as dispensationalists, sometimes I think we get too comfortable with saying, man, Lord, let it get worse and worse because we know you're coming. And as dispensationalists, which I'm a dispensationalist, and I do believe it's important to understand that. If you don't understand the word dispensationalist, that's fine. This isn't the time to figure that out. But the point is, dispensationalists can become very pessimistic and almost pray that it gets worse and worse because, God, that means you're coming. But there's people who are asking, maybe you haven't, but there's people who are asking, God, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Augustine of Hippo asked the question a similar way, and he lived almost 1,500 years ago. If there is a God, why is there so much evil? Not, if there is a God, why is there evil? Why is there so much evil? In his book, Reflecting on the Problem of Evil, the author C.S. Lewis summarized it this way. If God were good, he would wish to make his creatures perfectly happy. And if God were almighty, he would be able to do what he wished. But the creatures are not happy. Therefore, God either lacks goodness or power or both. Please understand, don't don't castigate C.S. Lewis right now for saying that. He was summarizing the argument. We can point our finger at bad theology on other places of C.S. Lewis. But right now what he was doing is painting the picture in his book, The Problem of Pain. He was saying that people, God's creation is not happy. And think about that. Don't you think that it would make sense that if God were good, he would want his creatures to be perfectly happy? You parents in here, I know I tell my children I stay up at night thinking of ways to to make life painful. But we are instructed as dads in the Bible to not provoke our children to wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As parents, do you want your children to be happy? I do. I want their happiness. I don't want life to be miserable for them. That is a bad time. (laughs) Wow. It says 615. We're just getting started. You want your children to be happy. Don't you think, and even, don't remember when Jesus was talking, he said, hey, you know, fathers, don't you want to do what's good and right for your children? If they came and asked you for bread, are you going to give them a stone? If they said, hey, give me a fish, would you give them a scorpion? No, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. So I don't think C.S. Lewis is completely far off here where he says it would make logical sense that if there is a God and he, if he is good, then he would want his creatures to be perfectly happy. And if God were almighty, he would be able to do what he wished. 
So there's a second part. Maybe he's in heaven. Oh, I really would like Tavis Long to be happy. Gabriel. We can't do it. I just can't. But I wish it. As if he has no control. But today, tonight, we're going to discuss this problem of evil. Even the prophet Habakkuk. The prophet, the prophet Habakkuk. He said in Habakkuk 1.13, Thou art of purer eyes than, of, than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. In other words, the prophet was saying, God, you are good. Your eyes are pure. You can't look on evil. You are a good God. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously? Then why are you looking at evil? God, and holdest thou thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? God, why don't you do something? That's the prophet Habakkuk who's saying this. God, you're too good for this. And consider Gideon's question in Judges chapter 6. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then all this evil? Or why then is all this befallen us? Gideon asked God, if you're for us, if you're on our side, why is it so painful? So what is the problem of evil? Practically, the problem before us tonight, it typically sounds like one of these questions. If there really is a good God, why is there so much evil in the world? Or maybe this question. Why a Hitler and a Holocaust, a Stalin and a Mao? Why was there even a September 11, 2001? Why, God? Or maybe this question. I can't possibly... Believe in a God who would allow my mom to suffer from cancer and die. I cannot believe in a God who would allow child sex trafficking. I can't, allow, I can't believe in a God like that. I can't believe in a God who would let parents abuse their children. I cannot possibly believe in a God like that. Or maybe you've heard this question. If God can really do anything, then why doesn't he just get rid of evil? Or we ask, why, Lord, when our experiences and our knowledge of who God is do not seem to line up? God, this doesn't make sense. I, I was told to trust you. That my God shall supply all your needs. And yet I don't have a whole lot of money. And I'm suffering. Or what about those who are starving in this world? Does God not love them? This is a, this is a problem, I think, in, in American churches, too. Where we thank God for the blessings he's given to us. And we say, God, thank you for, for being with us. Thank you for letting this happen to us. When there are billions of people who God must not like. Because they didn't get that blessing. And so we then may be, careful, may be drawn into and say, it's just not fair, God. It's not fair that people suffer unjustly. And if you look around our world, it is true. People are suffering unjustly. Do you have a question? Okay. Would, would it not be fair to, to say when God created man and then the fall in the garden happened, he created evil because he gave us a free will. And that free will is a sinful, we're sinful people. And, that, and it could it be that we, he created evil by creating man who then had a free will, then the fall. I'm going to stop and translate, because on uh, 
those that are watching do not probably hear you. So what, and I'm going to give your name, Brian Tarkenton asked, uh, a very astute question. Is it not fair, let me make sure I get it right, is it not fair to say that when God created the heavens and the earth, he created evil, but he gave man a free will? And he created us, and therefore he created evil. We're going to get there. We're going to talk about the role that free will plays. Now, when I talk about free will under number, I forget which number it is, and there are common solutions there on your thing. If I don't answer your question, ask it again, and I will deflect it again then. Uh, no, I will... Uh, I'll try to get to it then, or I, as I've learned, I could just say, that's an excellent question. We'll circle back. All right? All right. <laughs> so anyway, we'll, we'll go on. But I think we'll, get, I think we'll answer your question. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tremendously important question. All right? So, uh, so these are the questions that have been asked. John Stuart Mill, he was a philosopher, a utilitarian philosopher, uh, he summarized these questions philosophically, and here's how he put it. He said, if God desires there to be evil in the world, then he, and he now, let me, this is different from C.S. Lewis, who was packaging it together and making a question. This is John Stuart Mill, Mill in all his apostasy, and he is going to say, he is pointing his finger at God, and he is saying, if God desires there to be evil in the world, then he is not good. If he does not desire there to be evil, yet evil exists, then he is not omnipotent. Thus, if evil exists, God is either not loving or not all-powerful. Evil casts a shadow over God's love and power. This is no small dilemma, John Stuart Mill says, and answers to it are exceedingly difficult. What is at stake as we consider this question at least to unbelievers who you may come across, which I, I, I know we struggle as believers with evil and the, the existence of evil, and I trust we'll be able to encourage you in that. But as you come across unbelievers, this is the predominant argument for why they don't know if they can trust God or not. Because the reality is they're hurting. And, and they have parents and sisters and brothers and loved ones, aunts and uncles who have died, who have suffered, who, uh, or they can turn the news on and they can see everything that's going on, and, and they are hurting. And so what's at stake here, for at least for unbelievers, is the idea that God cannot be all-powerful or that he cannot be all-good. I, I, I find this on the ship when I deal with sailors, and I say, hey, and we get into the gospel, and I have to be very careful that I, how I use the terms of your loving heavenly father, you know, you need to trust him, and, and he loves you like a child when their father did not love them the way they sh that they should have been loved. These are roadblocks sometimes in the language we use to their accepting Christ or God. And, 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 I, and I, don't wanna, I don't wanna just put it all the, the weight on us. The weight is on the Holy Spirit to draw them. And, and the Holy Spirit will knock down those barriers. But there are times when we, we say things and, and again, it's like either two ships passing in the night, they don't understand what we're saying or they have completely different definitions of father than what we think of a heavenly, loving heavenly father. So that's what's at stake here. This is the problem that we're going to try to reconcile. And we will conclude that despite all the evil in the world, God is all-powerful and that he is all-good. And we're not going to endeavor, we're not proving his existence anymore. We're going to presuppose that. We have already considered those arguments. Now we're going to presuppose that he does exist and that he is good, and yet there's still evil in the world. And how do we reconcile that? All right, so there's some common solutions. There's some common solutions, and, and it's important that we define a, a term here. Now, this one, theodicy. Theodicy. As I was telling my kids, because I... I practice a lot on them of some of the things I'm teaching. And I said, 
We're going to talk about theodicy. Yes, Dad, let's watch Odyssey. <laughs> or let's listen to it on Odyssey. And it's, this is theodicy. Now, I introduced you to a term. No, I didn't introduce you. You knew the term originally when we started this class, apologetics. What is the definition of apologetics? What's it mean? Do you remember? Apology, apo apologia, if you remember the Greek. What, what is the word apologetics? What is it? Do you remember? A defense. That's exactly right. Thank you. The, a defense. A def when you're doing a, 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 an apology, a defense, really the burden of proof is not on you. You can give what the Bible has to say, and, and you really don't have to prove it. You can just present it uh, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a defense. I, uh, this is on my Wednesdays at work. I have the, uh, the custom, the, uh, the opportunity, if you will, to go to executive officer inquiry. For those of you in the Navy, that's the time, the opportunity where sailors get to stand before the XO to, do, just, to just explain some actions that they have taken in their lives. And the XO then gets to make a determination of whether or not those sailors are contrite enough or whether they need to be encouraged in their career and move to another level of, uh, of opportunity to go stand before the commanding officer. And in an executive officer inquiry, they always go the same way. They say, why did you do what you did? And it's an opportunity for them to give a defense. And trust me, the burden of proof is not very high for them. <laughs> Sometimes the XO is just saying, just admit you did wrong. You probably don't know why. Nobody knows why you did that. But just own it. And so the burden of proof is what we do in apologetics. Uh, or we don't do. We don't, we don't have to, we're not really trying to prove a whole lot. You can get into the, uh, the, uh, the uh, existence of God, and, uh, and you can really try to prove the existence of God. The reality is, when it comes to evangelism, and you could just say, I know whom I've believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know whom I've believed. And that's Okay. And that's a you can you can give that defense. Now we have talked about a little more detailed of some some what I call rational arguments. But when it comes to the problem of evil, it's difficult to just give a defense of evil. <laughs> it, it's relatively simple to give a defense of God and say, "Hey, I believe it." It's harder to give a defense of evil because many are just like Job who say, God, you need to tell me why. And, and, it, and we could, remember the answer God gave Job? <laughs> Where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? God can give that answer. It doesn't go over as well for me. When they say, I'm hurting, I'm problem. Yeah, well, where were you when God created? I don't know, chaplain, where were you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's harder. And so this is very similar to apologetics here, but theodicy is a little different. The burden of proof is there. And I'll explain why. Look at our definition of theodicy. It comes from two words, theo, meaning God, and not dicey, uh, but it comes from a, uh, a, uh, uh, the, 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 the Latin for justification or justness. And so really it is the justness of God. It's, it's, a def it's, it's beyond a defense. It's justifying. It's providing proof now of why God does what he does. It's a vindication of the divine attributes, particularly holiness and justice in establishing or allowing the existence of physical and moral evil. Now, in that definition, I want to start at the very end there, and I want to point out two, thing, two words there, physical and moral evil. Now, physical evil, what would be an example of physical evil? 
Maybe. It is physical, but it does have an immoral perpetrator, right? There is a person doing it. Give me an, an example of physical evil. Disease. Disease. Hey, I, I know we can, we can argue where corona came from all we want, but it is a physical disease right now. Where we're at right now is it is a physical disease. And to, for me to stand up here and say, all of us who got corona, we did it because we were evil, would be wrong. Okay. I mean, when I got it, and I had, and they tested me positive on the ship, and I was supposed to, it was my first day on the ship, and I get this test, and they say, thanks, but no thanks, we do not want your kind here. Uh, I had to walk down a very lonely pier carrying my sea bags, and, uh, and, and I just felt like the entire crew was laughing at me. And I felt like, man, do I not wash my hands? Do I not, am I, am I unclean? What have I done? Am I, where, am I immoral? No, it It happens. And we can't point our finger at people and say, well, they got corona because God must be judging them of their evil life. No, it is physical evil in this world that happens. Now, what else? Earthquakes are physical evil. Floods, tornadoes, things that go on in the physical world are evil. And then there's moral evil. Give me an example of moral evil then. Now that you know what a physical evil is, what is a moral evil? Murder. Murder. And we're going to talk about that because we need to connect that in a second. Let's, let's hold on to that. But yes, what else? Abortion. Abortion. Murder, again. There, we could go on about all the moral evils that are in the world, but moral evil has a perpetrator, a person who does it. Now... You said murder, you said abortion, like we can put those two together. And let's say that uh, I, I have a gun, and I point it at someone, and I pull the trigger. Have I committed physical evil or moral evil? Oh, physics, though. Physics got me on that one. <laughs> when I pulled the trigger, and the hammer went back, and it hit the gunfire, and it or the gunpowder, and, it, and, it, and it, it, it fired the bullet, and, uh, and it put into motion something, and, you know, all the physical laws, that, or the laws of physics that were just put into that, I, it's just physics. You can't prove that. <laughs> but there's often when we do a physical and moral, for example, is cancer. Physical or moral evil? It's physical. But if I smoke for 40 years and I get lung cancer and I go and I say, man, I cannot believe this evil has overcome me. No, you didn't take care of the body that God gave you. And so I add a third category. I don't know if I'm allowed to but I call it composite evil. When you have physical and moral evil that go together and, uh, and, and happen. So let's take, for example, San Francisco, our favorite city to pick on, especially when it comes to ethical thought or lack of. Uh, and so I can say, my goodness, earthquakes. Earthquakes are horrible. But why build a city where there's earthquakes. Do, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, it's very hard to say San Franciscans, San Franciscans have a, a responsibility, you know, they're, they're to blame. You know, some of you are born there and you live there and you, you mean, but, but is there some sort of responsibility? If I build my house on the sand, can I expect it to crumble? Yeah. And I can't point my finger at God and say, God, why have you let this evil befall me? So we got to be careful what we're asking God to justify. Theodicy, therefore, may def be defined. It's really a science here that we're looking at, which treats God through the exercise of reason alone. But we want to be careful. Well, theodicy is a very cold term where it... it, it 
treats God through the exercise of reason. It's a science because it systematically arranges the content of our knowledge about God and demonstrates, in the strict sense of the word, each of its propositions. But it appeals to nature as the only source of proof, where theology sets forth our knowledge of God as drawn from the sources of the Bible. In other words, when we look at theodicy, we look around us, and, and, and if we're not careful, we take a step back and we just say, well, we're going to look at evil, and when we leave here this evening, we won't get this far tonight, but in a couple weeks, when we look at evil, I'm going to have a good, solid answer for it. But that answer will always come face to face with how people feel. And you can explain to someone why evil exists in the world, but, uh, but it's never going to suffice. But it's important that we look at this word theodicy, because I do think there are certain justifications for why evil exists. And we're going to look at physical evil, moral evil, and this composite evil. And the connection between the problem of evil, then, is, and we're going to look at this, and the, and the existence of God. So let me start by giving you a brief overview of our common solutions that we're going to look at. The question of the origin of evil has not been answered completely and satisfactory by any system of thought. But most systems have attempted to answer it. Several, several feeble attempts to deal with the problem of evil have been made. There's those who say evil does not really exist. It's illusory, and we're going to... Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to point some of these out a little more detail here as we go along. Evil doesn't exist. It's, it's illusory. Some have said God is finite and limited, therefore he is not responsible for evil. That's progressive theology. There are those that are dualists, good, and evil have always coexisted for eternity. There's the, Ar- the Arminians who will attribute to the origin of evil to the free will of man. We're getting there. Rather than to God. Just another form of dualism. So we want to be careful that we're not just saying it's just man's free will. Some would be in total denial. That is, the Bible does not really say what it says. That's what I mentioned there earlier, that evil really doesn't mean evil. They just change God's word to make it say what you think it should say. All these fall short of biblical theology. In fact, uh, biblical theodicy. In fact, if you look at many versions, they will translate evil in Isaiah chapter 45 as calamity. As an unfortunate event. I do think that the word evil is precisely what is meant there. So let's look at our common solutions. Our common solution, we're only going to get maybe through one, and we'll be done. Evil is unreal. Evil is unreal. It's just an illusion. They charge that since evil is just an illusion, the way to overcome it is mind over matter. This is many people's way of dealing with evil. It doesn't exist, actually. What are the problems with this? Exactly. It falls flat with human experience. Christian scientists are, are, the, are known to say, we don't need doctors. Because it's just mind over matter, it doesn't really exist. It's just a figment of your imagination. Brother Bassan, I told you not to sit so close. But if I came and smacked you in the face right now, that would be pretty evil, right? It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be Christ-like, I can tell you that. It may be a calamity for you. It may be a very unfortunate event. But if I came and smacked you in the face, at what point do you realize an evil has occurred to you. Yeah. I mean, because I hit hard. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Your life experience, and I could say, Brother Bassnet, seriously, this is just a figment of your imagination. <laughs> what you see here doesn't exist. And it says, because I do hit hard, his blood nose and teeth are all on the ground, and yeah, you know, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's say, but it falls flat with experience. So then we have to ask, why would God allow such an illusion to overtake us? 
Why would God allow this to happen? And I think there's some scripture references that, that defeat this idea that it's just an illusion. And I, I go to John 11. You know the story in John 11. Lazarus has died. And we see some very telling things from, I think, an emotional appeal from four different people. There's the disciples who, when Jesus says, hey, he's, he's, Lazarus sleeps. And they say, hey, if he's sleeping, that's good for him. He'll get better. And they said, Jesus says, hey, Lazarus is dead. And I could just imagine the air went out of the room with his disciples. I think there was an emotion. I don't think there was any illusion to them that Jesus' friend had died. Then we see Mary and Martha. And what do they come? And they say, God, Jesus, if, if you'd have been here, our brother would not have died. And then even when he says, hey, go show me where he lays. Oh, 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 oh God, <laughs> he's been dead four days. And he stinks by this point. There's no illusion over what he smells like. The smell of death will come out of that tomb. And then Jesus himself, he shows up to the tomb. And in fact, it talks about him groaning. And then the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus, it's just your imagination. No, you don't weep over an illusion. We could go to Job chapters 1 and 2, and then his friends coming and trying to comfort him. And we could say, Job, all this has not really happened. It's just, your, this isn't really evil. And yet he's got the boils, and his breath stinks, and he's sitting in ashes. He's just lost his, fam his children. He's lost all of his material wealth. He's got a wife who has said to him, hey, just curse God and die. Because she knew, she smelled his breath. There was no illusion. Evil's not just an illusion. It is here. It is with us. Hey, bring your notes back next week because we'll pick up common solution number two, which says it's just good in disguise. And we as Christians sometimes get caught up and they say, not me. I think it's bad. It's never in disguise. But if we misuse the verse, hey, all things work together for good. And I'll share with this story as we go. I was in seminary. And we were talking about some things, and, you know, that's what you do in seminary. You solve all the problems. And we were talking about, as pastors, how do we deal with uh, families who have just lost their children? You know, uh, whether it's through uh, a stillborn or miscarriage or things like that. And, uh, and there were two answers that kind of surprised me. One guy, he says, I would just tell them that God really meant that for good. So I'm not sure that's going to go over well. <laughs> Another guy says, I would just tell them, I just owe it to them to be honest. And I would just tell them that uh, you can pray that they are part of the elect one day. And you may see them again, but you probably won't. <laughs> I'm like, man cold. And as a 21-year-old seminar, I knew that was probably not the bedside manner you wanted to have. And it wasn't until I was in the, in the ministry myself, and I, was, and I sat with a Marine who had just lost his, 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 his baby, and it was stillborn. And I remember we were sitting there in, the, uh, in California in the, uh, uh, in the funeral home in a casket the size of a shoebox. And I remember we walked, to, just, we didn't need pallbearers. He carried the, the, the baby himself and laid him in the ground. And I remember the words, what, Lord, what am I going to tell this person? Because evil is very real. And I had to be careful that I didn't just say, hey, God meant this for good. And I'm not saying that verse in the Bible is wrong. 
but it's out of context if we if we take it out of context and, and we can we can do a lot more damage if we if we have this holier than thou pious view of saying hey it's god don't worry god means it for good so we'll look at that next week it's just good in disguise that's a common solution that a lot of people try to tell themselves it's just this is just good in disguise but we'll go into more detail next week dearly father thank you for this time lord we have not done justice at all to really the presence of evil and, and God, how you, you, not that evil is good, but that you work all things to, for your good, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to your purpose. And so we haven't done justice to that tonight, Lord. But Father, as we look, may we be careful not to get caught up in, in a lot of the other things that may distract us from your holiness and from your greatness, mainly to say that evil is just a disguise or, may, or to just say that evil is something that is just good and we just, uh, uh, we just need to accept it or to say that evil is not actually real. Father, no, it is real, but you are more real and you are more powerful than our circumstances. So I don't know what is hurting those that are here tonight. But Father, would you encourage them? You are more faithful than I can be. Father, you have you promised you'll never leave us nor forsake us. So would you encourage them through your word as they study and as they look into it? Lord, I pray that you would encourage them as they see evil all around us. And so, Father, may we leave here not discouraged, but encouraged, knowing that you are a God who is on the throne. And Father, we didn't really go deep into those truths tonight, but I pray that we'll be reminded of them because they are things we have heard. They're things we've heard preached from this pulpit as our pastor has been faithful to the whole counsel of the Word of God. And so I pray that we would recall your blessings and recall your promises, and we would leave here encouraged in that. Until next time, Father, I pray that you watch over us and that we would not be overcome by the circumstances of the world but we would keep our eyes on you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We'll see you next week. We'll pick up with the next part of this. Bring your notes back, if you will, and we'll have extras next week for you as well.